But um, we believe that nothing is more important than the Scripture. Nothing's more important than Scripture. Not our ideas. Not man's traditions. Nothing else even comes close to being as important as the Word of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 6 is where we have been taking our text for the last few weeks. Hebrews chapter 6, and uh, we're going to begin with verse number 1. Hebrews 6, beginning with verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 3. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Praise God. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Amen. I want you to notice that he spoke of the doctrine. Singular. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a lot of folks who are of the opinion that as we read the Word of God, God entitles us to our own opinions as to what the Scripture means. But the Bible does not teach such a concept. Uh, It's not about us coming to our own conclusions. In fact, the Apostle Peter wrote that no, no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Amen. And so it's not about the way I interpret the Scripture or the way you interpret the Scripture or the way Grandma interpreted the Scripture or the way any other preacher or priest interprets the Scripture. It's about how does God intend for it to be interpreted. And and I, I submit to you that we can find the answer to that question by searching the Scripture. I believe that for any verse of Scripture where we might have a controversy or a question, there is another passage somewhere in this book that will explain what that one means. I believe that. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that actually unfold tonight as we get into the word of the Lord. Amen. As we continue on in our study of the doctrine of baptism. And the word doctrine in the original simply means teaching. The teaching concerning baptism. Amen. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. Would you just put your Bibles down for just a moment and let's lift our voices, lift our hands, talk to the Lord and ask Him to speak to us and to speak to every heart that is present in this service tonight. Can we do that, everybody? Amen. Let's let's talk to the Lord for a few moments. Jesus, we need you. I ask you, God. In Jesus' name, would you just worship Him right now, everybody? Let's take a moment, just worship the Lord together. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Now, I want to begin tonight by saying that normally when we are in a series of study, I will take a uh, an amount of time out of that lesson to do a review of the principles that we have taught up to this point. Uh, tonight, I'm not going to do that. We've got too far to go. There's just a couple of things that I want to touch on, and then we're going to move right into tonight's lesson. But uh, I will say to our guests tonight, uh, if uh, anyone is here who has not been a part of the previous two lessons, uh, they have already prepared copies of the last two lessons. They are available. You'll stop by the sound booth free of charge to you. Uh, just stop by and ask for those CDs, and you can take those home and listen to them. 
and uh, hear the things that we've discussed in the last few weeks on this subject of water baptism. And uh, again, I, I, I don't have the time to go back and reteach all of that. And so rather than even deal with it tonight, I'm just going to tell you that, that uh, uh, they have already prepared the CDs. And I think we have how many? We have there, Yes, but how many copies do you have available right now? You have five copies of the two CDs. We've taught two lessons so far on this subject, and they have five copies that are already made up and available. So please stop by and get your copy uh, if you were not here for those lessons because we want you to hear what the Word of God says. Now, one of the few things that I do want to do by way of review is tell you that in our opening lesson, we discussed a question that was asked by Pontius Pilate as Jesus stood before him just prior to the crucifixion. And uh, Jesus said, I have come to bear witness of the truth. And Pilate looked at him and asked him a question that uh, really every one of us ought to stop and consider. And that question was simply this, what is truth? What is truth? You ever felt that way? You know, listen, as, as we go not only through this metropolitan area and through this state, uh, but throughout the United States and around the world, there are churches teaching everything imaginable. And all of them claiming it's the Bible. In fact, there are, there are people uh, who call themselves Christians who are teaching that Satan himself is going to be saved. So, so there's everything imaginable. There are churches ordaining homosexuals to be ministers in their church. Everything imaginable is out there. And so we have to stop and ask, what is truth? How do we know what the truth is? Well, Jesus gave us the answer to that question in John 17 and verse 17. Listen to what he said. Sanctify them. He's praying truth. now. Sanctify them. Speaking of the apostles, the disciples that were there in that room with him in the upper room on the night of his betrayal. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. That's the end of the discussion. It doesn't matter who believes what. God is not running a democracy. God is not taking a vote to find out how many people believe in a certain way. The Word of God is truth. Period. And so if what we believe contradicts the Bible, then what we believe is wrong. In fact, if the whole world believes something different than what the Bible says, then the whole world is wrong. The Apostle Paul said it this way, let God be true and every man a liar. So God is truth. His word is truth. Amen. And so that's what we're not here tonight to talk to you about what some denomination teaches. I'm not going to present to you tonight the philosophy of some religious leader. I'm not here to give you my opinions. We are here to talk Scripture. Hallelujah. In fact, how many pages of just Scripture do you have there, Brother Merriman? Four pages of just Scripture. We may not get through with all those tonight, all right? But I'm just telling you, we, we're not here to talk about opinions. We're not here to discuss ideas. We're not here to talk about denominations. We're here to talk about the Word of God. His Word is truth. Our opinions are meaningless. We are not going to be judged by what we think. We're not going to be judged by what we believe. We are going to be judged by the never-changing Word of God. Amen. And you know, one of the things that Jesus condemned the Pharisees over was that their traditions were more important to them than the truth. Amen. And if time permits, we'll get to that passage of Scripture tonight. But Jesus condemned them for hanging on to their tradition rather than accepting the Word of God. And I just want to encourage you tonight, as we go through this study, don't be so engrossed in your own tradition that you're not open to what the Word of God has to say. Amen, amen, amen. So that's all the review we're going to do tonight. We're just going to get right into the lesson. Amen. I want to talk to you about what men call a baptismal formula tonight. 
Amen. Now, how important is a formula? Well, if you've ever studied chemistry at all, you understand that an improper formula can be an absolute disaster. Amen. Getting the formula right makes all the difference in the world. In fact, you can take one part oxygen and mix it with two parts hydrogen and you get H2O or water. Something we have to have to live on. But if you add one part carbon to that formula, it becomes CH2O, which is formaldehyde. And we don't want to drink that. Remove the hydrogen and the result is CO or carbon monoxide, which can kill you. I'm just telling you having the right formula is absolutely essential. Getting the formula right. Now, if this is if this is true with oxygen or, or, or other molecules, uh, how much more important is it when we're dealing with the Word of God? I'm telling you, it's not going to be an accident if we go to heaven. We're not just going to wake up one day and say, oh man, I was saved and didn't even know it. It's not going to happen that way, my friend. We're going to have to do what the Word of God tells us. Here's why. John chapter 14 and verse 6 says this. Jesus saith unto him. Jesus saith, I am the I am one of those next two words. I am the way. You understand the importance of that uh that article, the I am the way. That means to us in English, I am the way only way. There are not many ways. There are not a bunch of ways. There are not even two ways. There's one way. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. If we're going to go to heaven, we're going to go the way Jesus tells us to go. Amen. 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 He did not say I'm one of many ways. He said I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, we've already discussed over the last few weeks how important this subject of baptism is. And I want to tell you that as important as, the, as this subject is, it is also important that we make sure that we have the right formula when it comes to water baptism. Let me prove that to you. Again, we're going to go to the Scripture. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Now, let's look at these verses of Scripture. And if you want to follow in your Bible, you're welcome to do that. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Read. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. All right, no, 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 hang on. He found, he found what? Found certain what? Disciples. These are not heathens. These are not pagans. These are disciples. These are followers. Everybody's with me? All right. Verse 2. He said unto them. He said to them. Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Well, now, you know what? This is a question that we're going to teach on somewhere in the near future. But this is extremely important as well. Because there's a lot of folks that say the moment you believe, you have the Spirit of God in you. But that's not what Jesus said. The King James says, have you received it since you believed? Some other translations put it, did you receive it when you believed? I don't care how you want to interpret it either way, but it is very clear. It's not an instantaneous thing that just because you believe you've got the Spirit. Right. And he's asking them, have you received it since you believed? Read. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. A lot of folks in this condition, a lot of folks call themselves believers, but have never heard about the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's why we're going to teach on it the next few weeks. Read. And he said unto them. He said unto them. Unto what then were you baptized? So tell me how you were baptized. And they said and unto they John's said, baptism. All right. Now, this is important. First of all, I want you to understand these folks have already been baptized. Right? I mean, they're telling Paul they've already been baptized. And the second thing is, they were baptized by John the Baptist. Now, that's a pretty impressive credential. I mean, Jesus said of John the Baptist, there is no greater born of women. 
So, I mean, if John the Baptist baptized you, wouldn't you feel pretty good about your baptism? You'd feel like, you know, that man, I've got it. I've got it. If anybody's got it made, I've got it made. But we're going to see what happens to this group that were baptized by John the Baptist. Let's read on. Verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Yeah. When they heard this. So when they heard this. They were baptized. They were what? Wait a minute. I thought they'd already been baptized. I thought they had already been baptized. See, when folks come along and and start telling you, look, you've been baptized. You were baptized as a child. You were baptized, you know, years ago. You you don't even have to think about getting baptized again. You, You don't worry. We better stop and read this passage again. Because the Bible clearly shows us some folks that were baptized once that had to get baptized a second time. Yes, sir. That's true. Hallelujah. And we've got to ask ourselves, are we in the same shape this group was in? When they heard this, what happened? They were baptized, they were baptized in, the name, in of the, Lord Jesus. the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, isn't this interesting? Obviously, the first time they were baptized, that name was not spoken. But now they're being baptized again, this time calling the name that's above every name. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, hallelujah. And so they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And what happened in verse 6? And when Paul, had Paul laid his hands, his hands on them. The Holy and Ghost the Holy Ghost came, came and they, spoke and they spoke in and tongues prophesied. and prophesied. All right, again, that's another lesson for another night. But I'm just telling you that Paul required a group of believers to be re-baptized. There was a reason why their first baptism was not valid. And we'll, we'll discover the reason why in just a few moments. Now, when I get to talking about baptism and how we ought to baptize, invariably, the question comes up of Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, uh, and and so we're going to look at Matthew chapter twenty-eight and verses eighteen and nineteen tonight. This is really where we want to start in dealing with this whole subject of how we ought to be baptized. What needs to be said when we are baptized? Let's start there. Matthew twenty-eight verses eighteen and nineteen. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, "All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth." All right, now hang on right there. What statement does Jesus make in verse 18? All power what? Is given to me. Jesus said, I have all power. That's what he says. All right. Then he says in verse 19, Go ye there. Go ye. What's that next word? What does therefore mean? Because of what I just said. Because I just told you that I'm the one who has all power. Because of that. Teach all nations. Teach all nations. Baptizing baptizing them them in the name of the Father Father, and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Ghost. All right. Now, interesting verse of Scripture. Just leave it up there for a little while, uh, if you would. Interesting verse of Scripture. In in my previous lessons, I've talked about how that at the age of 17, I was invited to be the guest on a radio talk show. Uh, a man by the name of Zola Levitt. Some of you may have heard of him. He went on to, uh, to have a television program. He's now deceased. But uh, he had a radio program in uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex where I was raised. And uh, I was, uh, I, I worked at the radio station uh, during this time and, and got to know him. And I ended up becoming a, uh, and it wasn't through that, but that's just a little piece of the information there. He knew who I was because of all this. But, but anyhow, I ended up becoming a guest on his talk show on the subject of water baptism. And I began to give him scriptures that I'm going to give you tonight. And uh, it, it contradicted what he had thought and what he had believed. And so he finally, after a, a point in this uh, uh, this program, he, he, he stopped me and he looked at me. He said, look, look, look. You've quoted all these scriptures that say to be baptized in the name of Jesus. He said, what do you do with the dozens, hundreds indeed of scriptures that say 
that we are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I looked at him and said, there aren't any. His mouth dropped open and he changed the subject. Well, during the next commercial break, one of the engineers from the radio station came in. He said, well, explain Matthew 28, 19. I said, I'll be glad to. I'll be more than happy to explain Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19 is not providing us with a baptismal formula, and I will prove that to you tonight. Jesus is not saying, repeat after me. Now, here's what I told Zola that day. I said, I said, Zola, if God were to speak audibly from heaven, and say to me, go preach. Should have added some reverb or something. No, I'm just kidding. If, if God were to speak from heaven, say, go preach. And then I turn to you and say, Zola, go preach. Did I do what God told me to do? I didn't obey God. All I did was repeat His words. Jesus did not say in Matthew 28, 19, repeat after me. He said, go baptize in the name. Yes, sir. Baptizing them in the singular definite article, the name. There's no S on the end of that, is there? In the name. The one name. Not baptize them in the titles. Father's not a name. I'm a father, but that's not my name. Son is not a name. That's a title. He said baptize in the name. Now, I want you to also notice, and I'm not splitting hairs here, but, but you know, one of the things that I've tried to establish in all this is every word matters when you're studying the Scripture. He said in the name of the Father. He didn't say baptize them in the name Father. I literally have a book in my office where uh, Jimmy Swaggart taught that Father is a name. Which, which we all know is not true. And I'm not, I'm not slamming Jimmy Swaggart. I'm just telling you, it's in his book. You can, you can go read it. He said it. Uh, Father is not a name. But even if it were, Jesus did not say baptize them in the name Father. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father. Without getting too deep into Greek, the fact is this is what we call the genitive case. That means possessive. There is a vast difference between the name Father and the name of the Father. All right, let let me, let me just, I'm going to show you another example of the genitive case so you can understand what I'm saying and we'll come back to Matthew 20, 19. Put up here Luke chapter, uh, 3 verse 34. Luke 3 and 34. Which was the son of Jacob. All right, now we're, we're going through a lineage here. We're going through the genealogy here. And I want you to notice, which was the son of Jacob. And we'll say of Jacob. The son of Jacob. This is the genitive case, all right? Which was the son of which Isaac. Which was the son of Isaac. Which was the son of Which Abraham. was the son of Abraham. Which was the son which of Which was the Thara. son of Thera. Which was the son of Nacor. Which Nacora. was the son of Nacor. Now, you know, if you take out that little word of, it changes the whole meaning. Which was the son Jacob, which was the son Isaac, which was the son Abraham. If you read it without the genitive, all of a sudden Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Thera, and Nacor are all the same person. But there's a reason why this is genitive case. It's not the son Jacob, but the son of Jacob. Not the son Isaac, but the son of Isaac. Everybody sees this? We're talking about a possessive case. So put Matthew 28, 19 back up here again. All right, now he doesn't say baptize them in the name Father, but in the name of the Father. So what we've got to do is find out the Father's name. If we're going to obey Jesus, we've got to learn the Father's name. Well, hallelujah. This is what he said. He said, baptize them in the singular, singular name, the name which belongs to the Father and which belongs to the Son and which belongs to the Holy Ghost. We got to find out the name that belongs to the Father. 
The name that belongs to the Son. The name that belongs to the Holy Ghost. So what is the name of the Father? John chapter 5 and verse 43. I am come in my Father's name. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name. Now what name did He come in? Jesus. He came in the name Jesus. So what's His Father's name? Jesus. Well, praise God. His Father's, if He came in His Father's name, Then his father's name is Jesus. What's the name of the son? Matthew one twenty one. And shall sh- uh, and she shall bring forth. She'll bring the son, forth a son. And thou shalt thou call, shalt his, call name his name. Jesus. So what's the name of the son? Jesus. Jesus. All right. John chapter fourteen verse twenty six. But the Comforter which is the Holy the Comforter Ghost, which is the Holy Ghost. Whom the Father will, the send, Father in will send in my name. In my name. So what's the name of the Holy Ghost? I submit to you tonight, if you baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, you're going to baptize in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Now, I, I mentioned, I mentioned Sunday night we finished our baptismal service. I made mention of the fact that, uh, several years ago, many years ago, I had the privilege of baptizing a pastor, a neighboring pastor, who had for years been baptizing people saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And, uh, I had the privilege of, of baptizing him. And the way that all of that came about, I began having a weekly Bible study with him. We were going through the scripture together and, and I went over scripture after scripture, week after week after week, and somehow they just couldn't quite see it. But the next scripture we're going to read was the scripture that forever changed their minds. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 15. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Well, well, well. The Bible says the whole family in heaven and earth has the same name. And there's only one name that's above every other name. And it's not Jehovah. It's not Adonai. It's not El Shaddai. It's not Elohim. There is one name that's above every name, and that name is Jesus. The whole family in heaven and earth has the same name, and that name is Jesus. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. For neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the only name there is. Hallelujah. And so that's why, that's why I said to him, there's not a scripture anywhere in the Bible. That's telling us we ought to be baptized saying Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's not one. Not There is no verse of Scripture anywhere that says it. There's one verse in Matthew that says to baptize in the name. Uh, yes, sir. And we don't just go around repeating His words. We obey what He said. Right. Now, I'm going to show you tonight. I'm going to show you tonight. And this is this is something that we've got to ask ourselves. If Jesus meant repeat after me. Why is there not one example anywhere in the Bible where anyone ever repeated those words? If that's what Jesus meant, did every one of his followers make a mistake? Did all of them mess up? Was there not one of those men that understood he was saying repeat these words? Hey, they didn't, make, they didn't mess up. They didn't make a mistake. But let's look at it. Here are the examples in the scripture of people being baptized. And I'm not leaving any out. So you can, you, you can, in fact, you can go home and look all this up. Let's go through these. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is the very first time, in fact, that anybody, this is the first time that sinners in the church age ask what they've got to do to be saved. Acts chapter 2. Before this time, you know, when when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're reading, for the most part, pre-Calvary. The sacrifice hasn't even been offered yet. Right. You know, at the end of those books, they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. But but for the most part. So so if we're going to find out about sinners in the church age being saved, we got to go to the book of Acts. And the first time that anybody asks, in fact, 
can you put verse 37 up there? And I want to just show you this. In, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They want to know. The first time that anybody answers this question to a group of sinners. The law of first mention is extremely important in Bible interpretation. Any Bible scholar will tell you that. The first time something is mentioned, it carries a lot of weight. And this is the first time sinners ask how to be saved. And Peter did not say, accept the Lord as your personal Savior. He didn't say, join a church. He didn't say, have somebody extend to you the right hand of fellowship. But here's what he said, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Peter said to them, Repent. The first thing he told them to do was repent of their sins. And be baptized. Then he said, Be baptized. Not some of you, but every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission for of the sins. Remission of sins. And, you and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so, here's witness number one. He said, he didn't say Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, did he? He said, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8. Now, this was the Jews. In Acts chapter 2, these were Jewish people. Every one of these were Jewish people. Acts chapter 8, it is the Samaritans. In Acts chapter 8, we find the Samaritans. Let's see how they were baptized. Acts 8 and 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Jews were baptized in Jesus' name. The Samaritans were baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 10 is the Gentiles. Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized. He commanded them to be baptized. In the name of the Lord. How? Not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is it? It's the name of the Lord. Who is our Lord? To us there is but one Lord, and His name is Jesus. So the Gentiles are baptized in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 19, verse 5. We read a moment ago, these are the Ephesians who were followers of John the Baptist. Acts 19 and 5, How? what, what was it? What was it that caused them to need to be baptized again? Acts 19 and 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, this time around, that name that's above every name was called over them in the waters of baptism. I'm telling you, that's the only reason they had to go back and be baptized, because it's got to be done in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 22, verse 16, the Apostle Paul is giving his own personal testimony. And he says, this is what Ananias told him. And now why tarriest thou? And I asked Paul, why tarriest thou? Arise and Arise, be baptized. Be baptized. And wash away thy sins. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's oh. an interesting phrase, isn't it? Isn't that an interesting phrase? He didn't say, he didn't say be baptized so you can show the world you're a Christian. He said be baptized so you can get your sins washed away. And how did he say to do it? Calling on the name of the Lord. Not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, was it? It was in the name of Jesus. Listen, that's why years later Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, and whatsoever, whatsoever you, you do deed, in word or deed, do, do it all Jesus. in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thanks to God and the Father by Him. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. You can go in churches all across this land, all around the world. If they're going to pray for the sick, they're going to do it in Jesus' name. If they're going to pray about their finances, they're going to do it in Jesus' name. If they're going to pray about their marital problems, they're going to do it in Jesus' name. But when they get in the waters of baptism, they throw the name of Jesus out and say, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I'm I'm telling you, Paul didn't say everything but baptism. He said, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Now, Matthew 28, 19. When we looked at Matthew 28, 19, this is what most folks call the Great Commission. This is where Jesus is commissioning his followers. In fact, this really becomes the dividing line uh, pretty much between them being disciples and being apostles. You know the difference? A disciple is a follower. An apostle is one sent forth. Uh, Once Jesus is taken up, 
then they're, they are sent forth to do the work that he was put here to do. And so it was at this point, it's the closing moments, it's his last few minutes on earth with them, and he tells them to go and teach all nations and baptize them. Matthew said that he said to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Luke records the, the Great Commission as well, and here's the way Luke says it in Luke 24, verse 47. And that repentance and remission repentance of sins, and remission of sins should be preached. Should in be his preached. Name. How? In His name. Amen. Remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Where did the day of Pentecost take place? In Jerusalem. That's where it started. What did Peter preach? Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. He preached, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. He did exactly what Jesus told him to do. And, you know, I have folks who tell me, well, it's only the Jews that had to be baptized in Jesus' name because they had such a hard time accepting him as their Messiah. I've literally heard these arguments or read them in books. But, but number one, the Samaritans we've already shown you in Acts chapter 8. The Gentiles, we've already shown you in Acts chapter 10. But here in Luke 24, Jesus told his disciples that you're to preach the same thing among all nations. It starts in Jerusalem, but it's not supposed to stop in Jerusalem. Every nation, that includes those that were not even founded when Jesus spoke the words. That includes the good old U.S. of A. That's us. Repentance and remission of sins has got to be preached in Jesus' name right here in America. Right. Jew and Gentile, it doesn't matter. And that's exactly what happened. Amen. Peter preached to the convicted crowd on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, telling them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Amen. Listen, listen, listen. Years ago, I was at a debate between a couple of preachers, I, I was there, and they were talking about this very subject. And uh, now things have changed a bit now, but but in back in the day, isn't that what everybody says? Back in the day, uh, things so much is done electronically now anymore that that some banks are not nearly as picky as they used to be. But but back then, during this debate, the 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 thing went back and forth about well, we can say Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or we can say Jesus' name. And I'll never forget the preacher uh, actually. Uh, writing out a check. I think it was $1,000, which was quite a bit of money back in the uh, late 70s. It's not a small amount today, but wrote out a check. I think it was $1,000, and he signed it, Father, Son, and Husband. He said, now you go get this check cashed. Well, he couldn't because the name had to be applied in order for the check to be valid. And the preacher made the point. He said, I'm telling you, baptism is the same way. If you want your baptism to be valid, you can't go putting titles on it. You've got to put the name. Right. You want to get remission of sins, you're going to have to do it in the name. Right. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, if you've been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and that's what they said, God bless you, all you got was wet. But when you go down in the name of Jesus Christ, something happens. Your sins are remitted. Your past is erased. Your record is eradicated because the name of Jesus gives you access to His blood. Well, praise God. Now, I mentioned a while ago the little booklet I've got in my office that says Father is a name. It makes a lot of other strange claims. Uh, that booklet goes on to say, and I quote, the Matthew 28, 19 baptismal formula is abundantly confirmed by the earliest Christian writings, while the Acts 238 formula has no historical support at all. That's what he says. Now, either he was mistaken or deceived or just plain untruthful. Um, I don't know and I won't judge. I'm just telling you that all you've got to do is make a trip to your local library to find out that what he said is not true. Are you ready for this? 
I'm not quoting apostolic authors now. I'm giving you historical references. I've given you scriptural references that show that everywhere it was done, it was done in the name of Jesus. Now let's go to history. The Encyclopedia Britannica. Hardly an apostolic source. Says, and I quote, everywhere in the oldest sources, it is stated that baptism took place in the name of Jesus. The Westminster Dictionary of Church History says, and I quote, the Trinitarian formula did not emerge until the second century. A hundred years after Christ. Before anybody started using that formula. Are you going to tell me that for the first hundred years, everybody was wrong? And finally, a hundred years after Christ is gone, somebody got a revelation. We've been doing it wrong all along. Those that sat at his feet, those that spent three and a half years with him, those that he taught, those that the Bible says he opened their understanding, they were all wrong and we're right. Doesn't quite work that way, does it? Doesn't work that way. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible says, and I quote, the evidence of Acts 2.38, 10.48, 8.16, 19.5 uh, suggests that baptism in early Christianity was administered not in the threefold name, but in the name of the Lord Jesus. The New International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, I quote, No record of the Trinitarian formula can be discovered in the Acts of the Apostles. The baptisms recorded in the New Testament after the day of Pentecost are administered in the name of Jesus Christ. That this formula was the established usage in the Christian church is proven by records of baptisms in Justin and Tertullian, which were early church fathers. In other words, it went beyond the apostles into the followers of the apostles and their followers. They all did it only in the name of Jesus, not saying Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The dictionary of the New Testament says, and I quote, it is maintained that the formula at first ran in the name of the Lord Jesus. Harper's Bible Dictionary says, the Trinitarian formula was a late addition. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says the phrase baptizing them in the name would indicate that the baptized one was closely bound to or became the property of the one into whose name he was baptized. The one into whose name he was baptized. The theology of the New Testament says there is the fact. I like this. There is the fact that from the very beginning Baptism undoubtedly was performed in the name of Jesus. That is, with the pronouncing of the name and hence with the invocation of Jesus. Now, I, I, I'm telling you tonight, my friend, if you go to the Scripture or you go to history, you're going to find out that it was somewhere along the line that man came along and changed the baptismal formula. And you've got to ask yourself, if this is the way Jesus told his disciples to do it, who's got the authority to change that? Who's got the authority to change that? Amen. Nobody does. Nobody's got the authority to come along and, and change what was set in the Scripture. Well, praise God. Amen. You know, years ago, and, and I'm going to skip through some verses, and uh, so you're going to have to kind of follow with me here, Brother Merriman, but um, uh, we're going to, somewhere down that list, we come back to Matthew 28, 19 again. And I'm going to, I'm going to jump down to that point, and you'll need to find it on the sheet because it goes Matthew 28, 19, then Acts 2, 38, and then on from there. We're going, to, we're going to jump to that point right now, and we'll come back and catch the rest of it maybe in another lesson. But a number of years ago, a man that I was pastoring was running a, uh, was managing a restaurant. Uh, and, and, uh, business was slow this particular day. There was nobody there, no other customers there. Uh, and a Catholic priest came in. I'm not here to, to bash Catholics. Please understand. I'm not, I'm not bashing anyone. I'm just relating a story. This Catholic priest came in and, uh, 
And so this man uh, who was attending my church, uh, the manager of the restaurant, sat down with this priest just to visit with him. Nobody else there. And so the two of them began to talk, and the subject of baptism came up. The, uh, the Catholic priest admitted to this man that it was the Roman Catholic Church that changed the form of baptism. You can go to their Catholic encyclopedias and find that. They don't hide that fact. Um, they're not ashamed of that fact. And, and again, this is not a slam, but the fact is that the Roman Catholic Church believes the Pope has the authority to change Scripture. And so it, it doesn't matter to them what the Scripture says if the Pope says otherwise. He is, he is uh, to them, basically God on earth, the representation of God on earth. Um, and, and so he has the authority to change the Scripture. So they freely admit, we changed it. We are the ones who changed the form of baptism from the name of Jesus to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And as the conversation went on, he told the man, he said, look, I want you to understand, I don't care what a person calls themselves. I don't care if they call themselves Baptist, Methodist. I don't care what they say they are. If they are baptizing using our formula, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we call them Catholic. I don't care what they call themselves. As far as we're concerned, they're using our baptism. They're Catholics. The man found that amazing. He said, well, let me ask you this. What do you call somebody that's been baptized in the name of Jesus? He said, oh, we call them Christians. So, for what it's worth. That's just in the for what it's worth department. Amen. Listen, listen. when folks come to me, and I've, I've literally heard people say, well, you know, I know Peter said, be baptized in Jesus' name. But Jesus said, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And, and this, this is what they tell me. I would rather obey Jesus than Peter. I've heard people say that. You ever heard somebody say that? I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter. Anybody ever heard that? I've, I've heard it. I've heard it. I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter. Now, here's the problem with all that. You, you've got to understand that when you make that statement, you are saying that Jesus and Peter contradicted one another. That what Jesus said and what Peter did were two different things. That there was a direct disobedience made by the Apostle Peter. When he got up and said to baptize in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus had said something totally different, if your argument is correct. But I'm telling you that when you obey Peter, you are obeying Jesus. There's no contradiction in the two. In fact, the only way you can obey Jesus is to obey Peter. Until you're baptized in Jesus' name, you have not been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is a repetition of the Lord's words, not obedience. We've discussed all that. Now, what, what, uh, I want us, I want us to think about this for just a moment. Um, Acts 4 and 12, we've read, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name given among men. Amen. Whereby we must be saved. Philippians chapter 2, we haven't read yet. Let's read that one. Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus every knee should every bow. Knee should bow. Of things in at heaven, the name of Jesus. And now listen. In earth and things under the earth. All right. Verse 9 said that it was a name that was above every name. I'm telling you, Jesus is higher than Father. Jesus is higher than Son. Jesus is higher than Holy Ghost. Jesus is higher than Jehovah. Jesus is higher than El Shaddai. Jesus is higher than Adonai. Are you hearing me tonight? It's a name that's above every name. Hallelujah. Amen. And so if we're going to baptize in the name of of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We've got to do it in Jesus' name. Another thing that you've got to think about, when you say, I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter, you forget what Jesus himself said about Peter. Matthew 16, verse 19. Let's look at this. And I will give unto thee the keys now, of the kingdom of heaven. I talked about this one night, but let me just say it again for the sake of our guests 
who are not here to hear me, when you see in, in your King James Bible this word the, it's not the same word as you. We, we, we've lost that old English, and so we get a little confused in all that, and we think it just means you uh, in the generic sense. It does not. But the word the is specific to an individual. The word you appears in the King James Bible. But when you read the word you in the King James, it, it is plural. As I've said down south, we would say all y'all. Everybody. The word you means everybody. But Jesus didn't say, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. He said, I give to thee. Speaking directly to the apostle Peter, I'm giving to you specifically the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Read. And whatsoever thou shalt. And whatsoever, earth, not, again, not you, but whatsoever thou shalt shalt bind on earth, shall be bound, shall in, be heaven. bound in heaven, and whatsoever, and whatsoever thou, shalt earth, thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying to Simon Peter, heaven stands behind the declaration you make. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Heaven is going to bind what you say. When Peter got up and said, baptize in the name of Jesus, heaven stood behind it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, let's think about something else here. Acts chapter 1 verse 13. Now, 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 before we read this verse, I want you to think about something. We're talking about those who say, I would rather obey Jesus than Peter. All right? Now, who penned the words of Jesus in Matthew 28 19? Who? Matthew, all right? Matthew was the one who wrote those words down on parchments. Everybody agree? Matthew was the one who said that. Matthew is the one who told us that Jesus said, Go you therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew was the one who said it. Everybody agrees? All right. Let's go to the day of Pentecost. Peter's about to get up and say, be baptized in Jesus' name. Let's find out who's present. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. Who's present here? And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James. Peter, James, and John, John and Andrew, Andrew Philip, Philip, and Thomas, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew. And, and whoa, whoa, whoa. Who? Who? Was Matthew there that day? Was Matthew present? When Peter said what he said? Yeah, he was there, wasn't he? Matthew was there. Now, let's go to chapter 2 and verse 14, and let's see. You know, you'd think if, if Peter gets up and says, be baptized in Jesus' name, and, and uh, uh, Matthew's there, and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on, Peter. That's not what Jesus said. Right. Stop. You're wrong. You're making a mistake. Don't get this wrong. I mean... Matthew's there, right? In fact, all of the disciples were there, right? All right, so Peter stands up to preach, and what happens? Verse 14. But Peter standing, Peter, up, with standing the up with the eleven. Lifted up you know, his voice. You know, let, let, me, let me say this. Some of you that are guests here tonight, as I've been teaching, preaching here tonight, you've seen a few in the crowd stand to their feet while I'm preaching. You understand what that means. That means I am in agreement with what you're saying. I want everybody to know I agree with what you're saying. When Peter started preaching, Matthew was not sitting there biting his fingers. Matthew wasn't trying to get Peter's attention saying, you're wrong, guy, you're wrong. Matthew was standing up saying, preach it, Peter. That's exactly right. That's what we're supposed to be saying. That's what you're supposed to be telling the crowd. Tell him, Peter, you're right. Hallelujah. Matthew knew that what Peter was saying was the explanation of what Matthew had written. Well, praise God. There's no contradiction there. Are you really going to try? 
to imply that the apostles gave wrong instructions to a crowd of over 3,000 hungry souls? Are you really going to say that? That Peter was wrong? 3,000 people that day and he led them the wrong direction? You know, I've been teaching here through the Bible on Sunday mornings. And I, I, one of the things I've said, the, one of the beauties of the Bible is when a man's wrong, the Bible points out he's wrong. David was a great man, man after God's own heart, but when he sinned, the Bible said he sinned. The Bible didn't cover it up, didn't try to hide it. Right. When somebody was wrong, the Bible showed they were wrong. If Peter had told this crowd wrong that day, in fact, there's another instance where Peter did do In fact, a couple of instances where Peter did do wrong. And the Bible shows us he was wrong. He tried to tell Jesus, you're not going to go to Calvary and die. And the Bible shows us right then, Jesus turned around and rebuked him. He was wrong. Right. Standing around the fire, he denies that he knows the Lord. The Bible tells us conviction gripped him. He went out and wept bitterly. He was wrong, and the Bible tells us he was wrong. But when Peter stands up and tells the crowd to be baptized in Jesus' name, there's never a correction offered. Because Peter's not wrong. I want you to, I want you to stop and think tonight. And I'm going to try to close on this note, but I want you to stop and think tonight. What does it really mean to imply that Peter was wrong that day? What it would mean is that the inspiration that was given to the apostles on that day was absolutely useless. It would imply that the time Jesus spent with them for three and a half years was wasted. I mean, this was their moment. This is what he was trying to prepare them for. And they blew it. No, they didn't blow it. But if Peter was wrong, they did. Peter wasn't wrong. It it, it would... It would, it would imply that the, the 40 days that he spent after the resurrection teaching them was a farce. He didn't do any good. And furthermore, let's look at Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 24, verses 45 to 49. Look at this now. Then open he their understanding. Then open he their understanding. Either they understood or the Bible is a lie. There's no way around it. If Peter was wrong, this verse needs to be cut out of your Bible. The Bible says that he opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. I'm telling you, when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, be baptized in Jesus' name, he wasn't mistaken. He wasn't wrong. He had a full understanding of exactly what Jesus wanted him to say. In fact, in fact, it's in this context that we get on down. Let me just show you. Let's read on. Then everybody remembers this. Then open he their understanding is what the Bible said. Verse 45, verse 46. Uh, it said on them, thus it's written, thus it behoove Christ suffer, rise into the third day. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48. And your witnesses of these things, verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, tarry in the city of Jerusalem, to be doing power from high. I'm telling you, that whole passage is based upon the fact that Jesus opened their understanding. When they got to Jerusalem and began to preach, repent, and be baptized, and receive the Holy Ghost, it was not a mistake. He was not wrong. He knew exactly what God wanted, and he declared the whole counsel of God. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, listen. If you're not willing to accept the words of an inspired apostle, throw away your whole New Testament because that's what it is. We're not talking about just anybody. We're not talking about a TV preacher. We're not talking about a radio preacher. We're talking about the apostles, the men that were hand-picked, hand-trained, anointed by God. We're talking about men that had the touch of God on their life. Second Peter one twenty one. Listen, listen, listen. 
For the prophecy came not for in the old prophecy. time by the will of man. Second Peter, Second Peter, one twenty-one. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy but men of God spake as, as they were the moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, that's how we got the whole New Testament. These men wrote as the Holy Ghost moved on them. The problem is, if you're going to try to pit Jesus against Peter, then Peter's not the only one that's wrong. It was Jesus against all of his disciples. Because as I've shown you, he was not the only one doing it this way. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, he said, you know, I got a revelation from God. But when I got through, I went back to the, to the uh, elders in Jerusalem and sat down with them and talked to them, made sure what I was preaching was exactly what they were preaching. And Paul went around baptizing everybody in the name of Jesus. When we get to the place that we cannot accept the words, again, not just of any preacher, but of one of the apostles. If we can't accept the word of the apostles, you better remember Jesus himself never penned any words that we have in our possession. The Spirit moved on the apostles. And we have to trust the apostles for everything we believe about the New Testament. Do you really think that God would allow such a huge mistake, such a glaring contradiction in His Word, as every one of the apostles baptizing using the formula that's found in Acts 2.38? Surely you don't think all of the apostles were wrong and disobeyed Jesus. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus said, John 17, 20. I'm trying to bring this thing down to a close, but John 17, 20. Neither pray I for these alone. This was on the night of his betrayal, and he's in that prayer we read at the beginning of the lesson. Uh, in verse 17, he said, Thy word is truth. This is a part of that same prayer. In verse 20, he said, Now I'm not just praying for these alone, not just for these that are right here in the upper room with me, but for them also. But I'm praying for them also, which shall believe, which on, shall me. believe on me. How? Through their words. Through their words. How are we going to believe on Jesus? It's through the words of his apostles. Jesus expects us to believe on him through their words. Whatever they said, we got to obey. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 says this. And are built upon we the are built the upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself. Je- listen, listen, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but the apostles and the prophets are a part of that foundation. We can't pull that foundation out. I'll tell you, we pull the foundation out, we're going to destroy the house. What the apostles preached is necessary for us. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to try to drive this point home tonight. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If any man, think if any man thinks prophet, himself to be a prophet or spiritual, or spiritual let him acknowledge, let that, the him acknowledge that the things that I write, that I write unto you are not just the opinions of a man, but if you say you're spiritual, then one of the requirements is acknowledge what the apostles told us are the commandments of the Lord. Now, now listen, this is a a total aside here, but that's why you'll hear us refer to ourselves as apostolic. That means we believe that whatever the apostles said, that's the commandment of the Lord. we got to do what the apostles told us to do. We're not trying to identify with a denomination. We're not trying to be a part of some church affiliation. We're just trying to say to the world, whatever the apostles preach, we believe that's the commandment of God. Because Paul said, if you're going to claim to be spiritual, you've got to acknowledge that what we write is the commandment of God. Amen. In fact, John, John carries it a step further. First John 4 and 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John said, This is how we tell. You know, we started out by asking, What is truth? And Jesus said, Thy word is truth. Well, again, you know, all these churches teach all these things and they all say they got scripture for it. So how are we going to define it any better than that? Well, John did. He said, You want to know what's truth and what's error? Compare it to what the apostles said. We, speaking 
of himself and the apostles. We are of God. Now, you know, I mean, if I make that claim, that's one thing. I mean, anybody can get up and say, I'm of God. But, but this is not just some man claiming this. We know the Scripture says Jesus sent these men forth. They were of God. He said we are of God and anybody that knows God is going to listen to us. But if you are not of God, you will not listen. What does that mean for somebody who says, well, I'd rather obey Jesus than Peter? You won't obey Peter? What does that say about you? Well... I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm trying to get you to think tonight. What does that say about you if you won't accept what Peter said? I'm telling you, Peter didn't contradict Jesus. Peter explained Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. I'm telling you, if you really want to obey Jesus, you're going to do it by obeying the Apostle Peter as well. Well, I could go on, obviously. My time is, is passed up tonight. Amen. But, uh, but I, I want you to, I want you to understand tonight. Amen. One more scripture. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Listen to this. There is a way, there's a way right that a seems right to a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Just because this is what seems right to a man doesn't make it right. The only way we're going to know it's the ways of life is if we're following the way, the truth, and the life. And the way we follow the way, the truth, and the life is by following those men that he said we are to believe on him through. It's very simple, really, when we stop and think about it. There's no contradiction here between Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2, 38. Amen. There's an explanation, not a contradiction. I'm glad I've been baptized in the name. In the name of the Father. I'm glad that name was spoken over me when I was baptized. I'm glad I've truly been baptized in the name of the Son. I've been baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost. One name. One name that applies to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that name is Jesus. Well, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Let's stand tonight. Lift our hands to the Lord. Thank you for truth, Jesus. Thank you, God, for this people that's gathered here tonight. Lord, I've done my best to deliver the Word of God tonight. Lord, I've tried to keep my own opinions, my own philosophy out of this discussion. And Lord, I've tried to present the unadulterated Scripture, Lord, to those that are here. I pray you would take this Word now. Let it be planted deep in their hearts, God. Let it take root. Let it begin to bring forth. Lord, if there are those that are here tonight that have never been baptized in Jesus' name, I pray that right now they make up their minds. They want to do it the Bible way. I pray God grant them grace to obey what the Scripture has to say. Amen. So their sins can be washed away by the invocation of that lovely Oh, grant it, Lord Jesus, I pray. Grant it, Jesus, I pray. Hallelujah. There's only one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. There's only one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Well, it's the water and the Spirit. One way to God. The water and the Spirit. One way to God, it's the water and the Spirit. One way to God, baptized in Jesus' name. There's only one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, let's thank Him right now.